Have you ever considered what it would be like to live near Jesus? Now, I know that we tell you, and we're being honest when we tell you, that He's always near you spiritually through His Word and through His sacraments, but I'm talking about as if He was His incarnate self near you, face to face, someone you can see, shake hands with, talk to, and listen to directly. We time, at times, we try to sort of envision ourselves in Bible stories, right, as if we would respond maybe better than the people we hear in the Scriptures, those sorts of scenarios. And I think that often when we think this, we underestimate what the experience would be like. I know I do. Our thoughts typically center around how wonderful it would be to interact with Jesus, all those burning questions that no one seems to know the answers to, I could ask Him. But when we look at the effect of the presence of the incarnate Jesus in the Scriptures, it's a much more complex effect that it has on fallen people. It is also, though, better than anything that we can imagine, more life-changing than any of our daydreams can surmise. So our gospel reading today, uh, really when you do the Sunday of the Passion, it's all of chapter 14 and all of chapter 15. Um, and for the sake of time, we didn't do all of those. I just did the first 11 chapters of Mark 14, and that's going to be the focus of our meditation today. But I would encourage you throughout this week to maybe take 20 verses at a time of 14 and 15 in Mark and just read them. As we go through the events of Holy Week, you'll get a full picture of all that Jesus has done for you and what He endures in order to save us. But let's turn to Mark 14, 1 to 11. And what we're going to be focusing on is the encounter with Jesus face to face and the different reactions and effects this has on those whom he encounters. So it doesn't take long in our text to, to get to our first encounter, and it begins by highlighting that the setting of this encounter. We're two days before the Passover and the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. Holy, holiest of days in the calendar for those of the people of God who observe their faith. And what are the religious leaders of the people doing to prepare for these holiest of days? Verse 1, and the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him by stealth and kill him. Can you imagine that? The religious leaders, just days before one of the holiest days of observance for the faithful Jew, and what they're working on and what is consuming their minds is an opportunity to kill Jesus. Well, their encounter with Jesus certainly doesn't match any daydream I've had about what that would be like. Their encounter with Jesus tells them that He is a threat to them that needs to be eliminated. Jesus, in the kingdom He's bringing, was a threat to their leadership and their way of life, and they liked their way of life and the fact that they were in charge. But Jesus has been calling out their misapplication of God's law, their hypocrisy, and their self-righteousness. They are afraid of Jesus. Now, their perception of Jesus as a growing threat to their way of life is made clear in verse 2, because they say, not during the feast, of course, because He's too popular, lest there be an uproar from the people. So they're afraid of Jesus because He's becoming more and more influential. Now, we kind of read over the phrase, the chiefs, priests, and the scribes were working together. These were two groups that didn't really work together. But they perceive Jesus to be so dangerous that they've put aside their differences and they're coming up with a plan to get rid of him. So their encounter with Jesus has prompted them to act in self-defense. They sense the threat to the ways of their world and to some of the habits of their own hearts. And thus they decided, we don't need Jesus, we need to get rid of this guy. Now it's easy for us to hear that reaction to Jesus and think, I would never react to Jesus that way. But unfortunately, we know firsthand it's true that sometimes Jesus is perceived by fallen sinners as a threat. For we often fall into this as well. 
If you don't believe me, ask yourself these questions. What does Jesus threaten in my life? What does His Word, what does His preaching expose in me and in the world that threatens something that I don't want to give up, that I don't want to change, that I'd rather keep doing? What are the habits of my heart that He is calling out? And very quickly we find ourselves encountering Jesus in the same way as them. Now we're going to skip a few verses to our second encounter. We're going to go to verses 10 and 11. And this encounter is between Jesus and one of His disciples, Judas Iscariot. Verses 10 and 11 read as this, Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray Him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give Him money. And he sought an opportunity to betray him. So Judas is the answer to all of their prayers, their their plans, right? We're looking for a way to get rid of Jesus quietly. What better way than someone from his inner circle saying, I can betray him to you. See, Judas's encounter with Jesus led him to respond with self-promotion. Now, we know that Judas was a thief and he struggled with greed, which is why money is the thing that's offered to him. It's what he was looking for. And when it looked like sticking with Jesus was not going to end well for him, he thought to himself, how can I use my situation and my relationship to Jesus for personal gain? What do I get out of this? Well, in the case of Judas, he gets an in with the religious leaders, he gets to make himself rich, and he gets to distance himself from potentially being incriminated, and he gets to distance himself from potentially being incriminated by his association with Jesus, all in one fell swoop. Not a bad plan if you're in it for self-promotion. Now, while it's true enough that Judas occupies a unique role in the narrative of salvation, the unfortunate reality is his reaction to Jesus isn't unique to him. We often find ourselves thinking along the same lines. What's in it for me? What will you do for me? Now, these types of questions sneak into our lives of faith often without us noticing. And we usually defend ourselves or justify ourselves by thinking, well, I'm not saying that about Jesus, I'm just saying it about His church or about one of His Christians. Now, there's a couple of uh, humorous YouTube videos that were put out a few years ago. They were trying to do a sort of Christian skit spoof on the show House Hunters. And so they did a couple episodes that they called Church Hunters. And it was sort of set up in a similar way. You have like a real estate agent who's going to laud all of the wonderful aspects of a church that you're looking to join in order to convince you to join. And here's the description of their videos. Sick of your old, boring church? Find a new one that meets your needs with this new hit show, Church Hunters. And the word your is in all caps to emphasize the sort of hyperbolic comedy that's about to ensue. Now, the video uses a lot of exaggeration and hyperbole to illustrate this tendency we have to go into a church and think, what's in it for me? What are you going to do for me? What can I get out of this? But one example that was particularly funny to me is in the second video, and the real estate agent character is lauding all of the wonderful things about this church, trying to get this couple to join. And he goes and he says, one of the things you're going to love about this church is their service times. They have a service at 8.30, at 10 at 1, at 5.30, and at 7. To which the prospective couple responds, there isn't anything around 2? <laughs> yeah, we were really looking for what we really need. We're looking for something between 2 and 2.15. Right? Now, of course, that's hysterical, but it's funny because it points to a truth, that often that's our mindset when we're looking for our engagement with Jesus. We want it on our terms to our benefit. So the sad reality is we often face the same problem as Judas, that we look at our relationship with Jesus and we seek some sort of self-benefit from it. What does it do for me? What do I get out of this? And then we start to ask ourselves the question that Judas, I'm sure, is asking himself in Mark 14. What happens when our encounter and relationship with Jesus poses a danger to us? What happens when our encounter with Jesus requires us to give up the very things that we would love to keep and have more of? Instead of sticking with Christ, we, like Judas, 
sometimes give him up in order to promote our own interests. But there's one more encounter discussed here, and sandwiched in between these two. And it's in this encounter that I think Jesus' effect on the sinner is truly encapsulated in its fullness, not with any sort of shallow wishing and daydreaming, but really and fully, in all of its challenge as well as its surpassing glory. And that is in Mark 14, 3 to 9, and it describes the encounter of a nameless woman with Jesus. And Jesus is so moved by this encounter that he says something of her, he says of no one else in all the scriptures. So let's look at verses 3 to 5 here. And while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, he was reclining at table. A woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly, and she broke the flask and poured it over his head. There were some who said to themselves indignantly, why was this ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they scolded her. The reaction of the people to this woman's behavior speaks volumes. They are baffled by it. They're confused. What is she doing? And they're not only baffled and confused, they're also angry. And they judge her and they scold her. But notice what Jesus does. Jesus rescues her. He says, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. See, Jesus addresses the argument they're giving or their justification for their scolding about giving to the poor, sort of a little rebuke where he says, they're here and whenever you desire to help them, you can, right? But I'm not always here. So he's making two points. One is, you guys are using an argument that you don't really act on to justify your scolding of this other woman, but also even the ministry to the poor and needy is secondary to Jesus. Then Jesus fills in the gaps so that we can really understand and those who are with him can understand what this woman is really doing. Verse 8, she has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. Now, Dr. Jim Veltz, who is one of our uh, Synod's premier Greek scholars, he wrote the commentary for the book of Mark, and he argues for a slightly different translation of verse 8 that gets better at what is really being done here, and this is his translation. He says, that which she came to understand, she did. And he argues that somehow this woman, by the grace of the Holy Spirit, believed Jesus' words, that he was going to die. Now, it's probably as it's sandwiched between these two instances of machinations against the Christ, there's rumblings going around. People are starting to sense that the established religious leadership is getting nervous at the influence of Jesus. I mean, we just celebrated them welcoming him into Jerusalem as a king. So between that and the Holy Spirit and her listening to the words of Jesus, because Jesus hasn't been shy about what he's here to do, three times he's directly told his disciples, I'm going to suffer many things and die, and in three days rise. And he argues that this woman believes that. And because of her faith in Jesus, because of what she's come to understand, she does what she can. And so she engages in an act of self-sacrifice. Instead of looking for self-promotion like Judas, trying to get out some benefit for her about what can Jesus do for me, instead of self-defense where I'm trying to get rid of Jesus so I can hold on to the things that I'd like to keep that he's asking me to put away, she loses herself. She gives up herself for the sake of doing something for Jesus. Such her faith has called her to do. Her response to her encounter with Jesus is self-sacrifice. She suffers a lot of losses in these short few verses. She suffers the loss of an extremely expensive perfume. So just to kind of give you a sense of that, 300 denarii would be the equivalent of 300 days of wages. So if you take sort of the average salary of of somebody in the United States is like $58,000, $59,000 a year, chop off two months of that, this ointment that she has just poured out completely is worth that much money. 
$50,000 or so. Quite a loss. You can understand now why everybody's indignant about the waste. But she also then, by the reaction of the crowd, we understand she loses something else. She loses her reputation, her status in the eyes of all these disciples of Jesus. They scold her for what she does and the waste that she's created. And yet, when she loses herself, Jesus rescues her. Leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. And Jesus, so moved by this act of faith, he says something of her, he says of no one else in all the scriptures. And truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. That's fulfilled today. We're talking about her. Jesus recognizes what this woman is doing for him. And he opens up the mystery of her self-sacrifice to the others gathered around and to us today. She believed and came to understand that Jesus was the Christ and that he was going to die. And that which she came to understand, she did. We aren't told exactly what Jesus did for this woman, whether he was one of the many that was healed by his miraculous powers, or that she simply heard him preach and was saved by faith in his words. But whatever it was, it caused her to have a faith in Him that led her to ask, what can I do for Jesus? And her answer was to give of herself. So I ask you as we get to Holy Week, we should be asking ourselves the same question. Not how do I preserve the things that I'd rather not give up, or what can I get from Jesus, and how is He going to serve me, but instead... Given what you've come to understand by faith, what are you going to do? What are you going to do for Jesus? Today we entered the gate of Holy Week, the city of Jerusalem, and we see this self-sacrifice honored by Jesus, and she's protected by Him as a result of her faith in Him, because that's the nature of His love. A love which he's about to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt to all those who've put their faith in him this very week. Through the events that are about to transpire, this love of self-sacrifice is going to be given of him for the woman, for you, for his disciples, and yes, even Judas and the chief priests and the scribes. That's the nature of his love. He sacrifices himself the truth which this woman has come to understand, and in so doing, he rescues our lives from being lost. That's the promise he makes in the book of Mark. He says to his followers, those of you who will lose your lives for my sake will find it. You'll be found in him, just as her life was found in him, rescued from the loss of self, even in a sort of temporal way from the scolding of those looking on. This is the nature of God's love for you in Jesus. That when you do things the world finds strange, and not only strange, but abhorrent or idiotic for the sake of Jesus, He rescues us. He rescues us the same way He rescues this woman. By going to the cross, dying in our place, and rising victorious over all those enemies. So in a way, you can think of all the events that are happening this week leading up to the culmination of Easter next Sunday as Jesus looking at all those who would scoff at you, his people, and saying, leave them alone. Why do you trouble them? They have done a beautiful thing to me. They've had faith in me. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. <laughs>